Welcome to the Thriving Farmers Podcast, where our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable and sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Today's podcast guest is Richard Wiswall, who is the owner-operator at Kate Farm in East Montpelier, Vermont. He's been farming over 35 years, um, starting way back in the late 80s. And so it was a really great interview, getting to know Richard a little bit more. I've been to several of his workshops and definitely read his book, which is the Organic Farmer's Business Guide. And I highly recommend the book. We talked a little bit about that, but the interview really focused on kind of what he's focused on now in his business and just how he came about getting more into thinking about the numbers. And it was really interesting that holistic management class was kind of one of the big things that changed his thinking back in 1993 after he'd been farming for almost a dozen years and he was you know, thinking about the next steps on his farm. We also discussed what the early days in certified organic land was um, before, you know, the federal certification program, the national certification program, and so what that looked like. We also talked in a little bit of detail about he is thinking right now and exploring the possibility of transitioning the farm over to his son to run. So we kind of talked about that. They've been working on that for a year and a half or so now and they're exploring that opportunity. So we talked through what it looked like, what the different aspects of that were, and what the future would hold for him with that. So it was a great interview. You know, Richard is very knowledgeable in the numbers of small farms. And one of the first things he said is, you know, small farms can make money. And one of the biggest fallacies in farming is that there's no money in farming. So we had a a great interview. I know you're gonna enjoy this and I'm always excited to speak about farm business with somebody because I believe that's one of the most important things for small farms to pay attention to, to make sure that they can stay profitable. So today's podcast guest is Richard Wiswall. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Well, hi there, Michael. Uh, Can you give us a little bit more about your background? You've been farming for a, a long time now. I've been farming for 38 years here at Cape Farm in central Vermont. And as for background, I was born and raised on Long Island, actually kind of in rural Long Island on the uh, halfway out on the South Shore. And then I went to college in Vermont and kind of drawn to the environmental ethos of Vermont. And while at Vermont, and while in Vermont at college, I went to Nepal for a semester abroad and really kind of changed my life. Lived with a subsistence farm family, came back, read Wendell Berry, Die for a Small Planet, Radical Agriculture, met with the Nearings. And then my, uh, during my senior year, my advisor, professor, put me on a tractor to disc a field and I was hooked. And so mm. after that, I had the opportunity to come to Cape Farm here in central Vermont. And I bought in, I didn't have a lot of money, but I bought in, a, I was a 5% owner and mm-hmm. then actually paid rent to the, this partnership that owned the land and kind of built up my business. And then in 1993, after 12 years of farming, I'd built up enough market and um, infrastructure and reputation that I borrowed $190,000 from the bank. And that's kind of when, you know, I really had to start paying attention to what I was doing yeah. <laughs> more so. And so, and then ever since that, that was back in 1993. And uh, so... Uh, now it's just my wife and, and I on the title. So you mm-hmm. know, the partnership is no longer owners of the farm and just being my way. Yeah. But that was a lot of money back in that day. That was actually. And um, it was, it made me think long and hard about it. And it was kind of like having my neck stretched out thin across a chopping block with a hatchet wavering over it. And he said, okay, don't screw up, you know, because mm-hmm. you know, you could lose everything if you do. And that's why, um, you know, you know, some of it was dumb luck and some of it was, you know, you know, trying hard and, and making it work. And it, luckily it did. Mm-hmm. Now, what was the organic farming situation or world like in those days? So this was back in 1981 and organic farming was just starting to get attraction. And it was kind of the beginning of the rise of the organic market. And myself and other colleagues around here kind of grew with the rising market. And so kind of a a rising tide floats all boats. And so we all kind of grew with this market and that actually Mm -hmm. worked out quite well. But back then, you know, sometimes I, you know, I'd be looking for accounts and I'd go and say, Hey, I'm farming here. And, you know, would you be interested in buying some, you know, cabbage or whatever? And they said, well, it's not organic, is it? And like, you know, (laughs) 
like, you know, that it was kind of a bad word back, not a bad word, but some people were very hesitant about yes. flying again. But that, you know, it changed dramatically over the years and now it's a well sought after product. Yeah. I actually remember the year we went certified organic, that was 2014. We were at a farmer's market and we had watermelons and someone came up and says, oh, I want real watermelons because they saw the word organic on them. And obviously at that time frame, they would just must have been an ill-informed consumer because by 2014, I mean, that was, there was a lot of organics and I think everyone should understand what it is by then. But there's still it's, always it's coming, but it's yeah. not not ubiquitous. No. <laughs> yeah. So back those days, what were your main crops? Were you doing the full range? Were you focusing on individual specialties, or? Well, I was a very young and full of energy, and uh, not a lot of experience. And I tried lots of different things. It's kind of taking the shotgun approach and see which ones hit mm-hmm. the target and grew way too many things and kind of, you know, in hindsight, I I wouldn't recommend doing it. It was kind of exciting. You know, my experience before moving here was having a garden. So you kind of Mm -hmm. have this garden mentality of like growing everything all the time. And that's what I did, but it just started to get out of, I mean, a lot of balls to keep juggling in the air and some of them dropped. So we did everything that we could possibly grow in Vermont, you know, during the growing season here, which, you know, we can till the soil at the end of April and keep farming outside until November. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of learn by mistakes, and I've made quite a few mistakes in my life. I try not to make the same ones twice, but it was doing everything all the time for different markets like farmers markets, CSA, uh, wholesale to co-ops and restaurants, and also through Deep Root Organic Truck Farmers, mm-hmm. which is a growers club that sells to Boston and New York areas down the eastern seaboard. So there's a combination of markets. So it depends on what we were selling at one point, you know, we're growing an acre of celeriac or an acre of pickling cukes for the cannery or, you know, a couple acres of potatoes for the local co-op. So our markets have changed and so we've shifted. But right now, my wife and I are getting older that, you know, we don't want to work as hard. And that's my son is, you know, thinking of stepping into the business that, you know, we've kind of shaved off things, done more of fewer things, maybe I guess Mm -hmm. I'd say. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have eight greenhouses, eight 96 foot long greenhouses, and we have 22 acres in cultivation, but only cultivate probably four of those in row crops. The rest of it's in a forage mix that my organic dairy farmer trades manure for forage, and it works mm-hmm. out great. Cool. So in those greenhouses and the four acres, what are the main crops you're focused on now? The greenhouses, we have three that are devoted to bedding plant production, you know, seedlings for yep. ourselves as well as, you know, home gardeners, you know, four packs of tomatoes mm-hmm. or six packs of broccoli kind of thing. And then the other greenhouses we grow in the ground, we grow rotate tomatoes, which are all grafted tomatoes, trellised and standard procedure there, rotated with greens like the arugula, cilantro, dill, beet greens, mm-hmm. uh, those kind of things. And then sometimes we even leave one fallow just to give it a real rest. Gotcha. And of those, is the bedding plants that one of the more profitable ones or? It's the most complicated one. Is it the most profitable? It's actually surprising. You know, they're all, they change profitability. You know, I've actually given up some of the more profitable things I've done just because it didn't fit in with our timing of the year and our product mix in our markets. So we grow bedding plants, tomatoes, greens, and we also grow uh, burdock root for the Boston market, which is through a deep root organic co-op. Okay. So those are the kind of things we've, we were also growing some CBD hemp as well, which is just recent uh, new mm-hmm. market. But, you know, nothing that we do is like head and shoulders above the other in terms of um, yeah. money make. Gotcha. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, you've been farming now a long time. Why do you continue to farm? What's drawn you to that? It's the greatest job on earth. I, you know, I love my work and mm-hmm. sometimes I might work too much. And as I get older, I don't want to work as much. But, you know, you can't imagine really anything better than working in nature, working with nature, growing healthy food for the community and treating the earth in a friendly manner. It's a really the perfect job. The reason a lot of people are attracted to it for all those great reasons, being autonomous and, you know, being a purveyor of great food for the community. You know, a lot of people, the reason people, not everybody does it is because the economics can be a little challenging sometimes. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get into farming and don't run it like a business. And when they don't run it like a business, the economics are incredibly challenging. Right. And I think most people get into farming, myself included, that they didn't want to learn about business. They wanted to be a farmer and grow food. 
But it, farming is like any other business that you have to pay attention to the, the checkbook and the way money comes and goes and other things that if you don't do that, it's going to fail. So, I mean, you could be the best grower, marketer, innovator, welder, what have you, but it all goes out the window if your farm fails financially. So you have to, you know, legs that you have to have your business stand on mm-hmm. to um, survive. You could be a great ecological farmer, but if you're not economically sustainable, you're not going to make it too far. Mm-hmm. I think that ties right into our next question, which is, you know, what makes a sustainable farm? And I think you've just hit on two of those principles right there. You know, to be truly sustainable, you know, a farm does need to be both ecologically and economically sustainable. But you can't cheat nature, you mm-hmm. know, at least not in the in the long run. So there's a balance of saying, well, I want to be sustainable from an environmental point of view, but also I want to be able to survive financially. And, mm-hmm. you know, you have, they have to go hand in hand. Absolutely. So as a farmer, there are endless tasks to be done. How do you make sure to focus and tackle the most vital priorities every single day? Well, effective management is really not that complicated in theory, Mm -hmm. although maybe more in practice. You know, if if you took everything you had to do and prioritize it, you know, in a list and then do the most important things first, that would be the most effective management possible, right? And Mm -hmm. so a lot of times what I do is I spend a lot of time doing this is, you know, making a list and remaking that list and trying to see which ones really need to get done and which ones can wait. And then actually putting it on a calendar. And once it's on a calendar, I then make sure it gets done. If it doesn't get done that day because it's raining or whatever, I have to go to the dock or whatever, then I will put it on another day. So you have to follow through with that. So my son and I, my youngest son who's uh, 32 and I are kind of co-managing right now that it's really good. So we talk about what needs to get done and we put it on a calendar, who's going to do it and when Mm -hmm. when it's going to happen. And then it tends to happen (laughs) (laughs) magically. (laughs) Yes. And I think that's one of the struggles as farmers. We tend to want to do what we want to do, not what necessarily needs done because there's certain jobs or tasks or things on the farm to end up being more fun. But the real challenge is to make sure that we actually get the things that are going to move our business forward the most. Right. So why do people wait till April 15th to do taxes? Mm -hmm. It's not the most fun, but there's a deadline. And that's the other thing is if you have it on the calendar or if you do have a deadline, you know, you have to get an insurance form filled out by X date, you know, it'll get done by then. But Mm -hmm. you're right. So some things aren't as fun. So you tend to do the things that are more fun. But if you look at everything, if you're to keep your perspective of saying what's most important, do those first, that makes effective management. Mm hmm. So let's break it down to the daily level. What do you feel is one of the daily habits that you strongly believe contribute to your success? I think getting up in the morning or the night before, organizing all the things that need to get done on, you know, in your head or on paper and saying, okay, what is it that I hope to accomplish? And then actually assigning a time block to what you think you'll do. So if I have Mm. to be at my desk, say, do payroll and deposits and bill paying, I'll say, okay, that's going to take two hours. And then you know, that'll be eight to 10. And then 10 to 12, I'm going to be out, you know, trellising tomatoes. And so I'll have a sense of what it's going to break. And, and, you know, it's not exact science, but at least I have a real sense of what's happening in my day. Yeah, I find that if I end up piling too much on my day and not getting it all done, that's really bad because at the end of the day, I feel guilty for not getting everything done, even though I gave myself too much to do. And as farmers, you'll never get everything done. I mean, yeah. maybe in the dead of winter, you might think about it, but it's really, there's so much to do at any one point that you, you have to choose, you know, which ones are the most important. Mm-hmm. And just work that way. So as you farm, there are always challenging times or situations that could have devastated or even ruined your farm. Um, but you're still here. You know, you've been doing this 38 years. Tell us about some of those situations that made you want to quit and what kept you going. The only difference between the people that succeed and don't succeed is that the ones that succeed are the ones that fall down and get back up again. And so to succeed, you just have to have the persistence to get back up and keep at it. You know, I had a devastating flood. We're on a floodplain in, in 1989. Mm-hmm. I, wasn't, I was eight years into farming and lost most everything we had. And one of my employees, dad, who was in the business, he was in the clothing business, actually, kind of came up to me and said, you know, as a business person, I'm really sorry to see this happen to you so soon because all businesses go have their ups and downs. They go through mm-hmm. cycles. And, and he said, it's just a shame that you hit a low cycle, such a low cycle so soon. Mm-hmm. Because most businesses weather that kind of thing if they're, you know, they've been around for a while. 
And that was a really good lesson for me to learn that, you know, yeah, there's some ups and downs, but, you know, you just have to weather those troughs in order to get back up again. Just a realization, really, that, you know, there's there's, there are ups and downs is uh, a huge awareness. Mm -hmm. And then just keep going. And keep going, you know, and again, maybe at some point you feel like it's not going to keep going. That's okay. And you know, I've, I haven't talked some farmers out of business, but I, you know, I do this business consulting with farmers and, mm -hmm. and ask them their goals. And, you know, are they getting, you know, I, my goal is to help them meet their goals. And sometimes farming is not in the cards and they stop farming and that's okay. I think they're happier people because of it. I don't want to see farmers farm over mm -hmm. everything else. I want them to realize their own goals. So generally, a lot of farmers, you know, continue farming. Some don't, and that's okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that flood a little bit. Um, did you implement anything after that to kind of eliminate that? Did you change at all where you're planting things, or you just realized it was one of those one in a long time and just keep in the same area? It was one of those one in a hundred year floods, but it's not necessarily it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in terms of, I'm like, I think it'll happen before a hundred years. It happened like four years later, but. I have land that's on the floodplain, but also land that's off the floodplain. And so we started cropping more. We actually plowed up ground that was out of the floodplain, might add a tiny bit of slope to it, but we could then, you know, mitigate our risk mm -hmm. by having some of the floodplains, some not in the floodplain. And it depends on when it floods, because back then, you know, spring floods are kind of normal and you know, there was no consequence for that. But now, ever since 2011 with uh, Tropical Storm Irene that came to Vermont, mm -hmm. came to the Northeast, that the FDA has now ruled if floodwaters touch a crop, the edible portion of a crop, you must destroy the crop. And so mm -hmm. that's a game changer in terms of ability to grow on a floodplain because you roll the dice every time. And so we roll the dice if we're planning on a floodplain and hope that it doesn't flood before we get the crop out of the ground. You can also, you know, mitigate those uh, risks by planting salad mix, which is every 30 days as opposed to uh, winter squash, which is, mm -hmm. you know, you have one shot in a season to grow it. Yeah. Or Brussels sprouts. <laughs> or Brussels sprouts or, yeah. you know, eggplant or peppers or anything with full season crop around up here. Yeah. Because we got hit and I think it was um, Irene that came through and dumped that 12 inches of rain um, and took out four acres of our production. And that was that the same lesson for us is we had all our fall crops on that, that floodplain. And so that made that we started thinking about, okay, how do we break these up? And so we're not putting all our eggs into that one basket, even though that was our best soil. Right. And if you only have floodplain land, you have to either look for other land or roll the dice or you buy some crop insurance, mm -hmm. which isn't, you know, if you have a total loss, it can help you out. But it's not the same as, you know, being able to get your full crop off the field. Yeah, because even with the flood insurance, you're losing customer share, all that as well. Right. You're out of the marketplace for a, maybe a whole year for that matter. Yeah. So we stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, those farmers that have gone before us. Tell us about, you know, some of the mentors that you had as you were starting the farm and uh, how that helps you shape your farm. When I first started out, we've, I had some very nice you know, diversified vegetable neighbors who would be helpful in terms of either sharing equipment or just helping out. And that's kind of one, you know, help. It actually happened in 1993 when I was kind of going through a questioning point in my life of saying, is this really worth it? Because I, I was working mm -hmm. really hard. I've been doing it in a while. And this is before I bought the farm and thinking like, you know, it's not really, I'm working too hard for too little money. And, mm -hmm. you know, thought about, hey, well, what else, uh, what else is out there? And I took a course, a holistic management course with Ed Martsoff, who is an excellent leader for me. And, you know, he really kind of changed my paradigm of, you know, the poor farmer paradigm that farmers mm -hmm. will never make any money. And that's a very widespread and ingrained uh, paradigm in our society. Mm -hmm. You know, there's jokes about it. It's like, how do you make a million dollars in farming? Start with two million. That mm -hmm. kind of perpetuates it. And what he would say, he says the biggest fallacy in farming is that there's no money in it. And mm -hmm. when he said that, it's just like, wow, that's a different view viewpoint. But then, you know, it really got me thinking and made me realize that, yes, that's actually true. It's very possible. And I'm not sure if it's a genetic defect in farmers, but they tend to whine a lot. You know, they, <laughs> yeah, the market suck, or the, you know, the pests and disease are out of control, you know, yeah. fertilizer prices are expensive, you know, they, you, or maybe they're the ones who get heard more, but the people that are actually making money tend not to brag, you know, that's kind of mm -hmm. the nature of it. 
but they're doing fine. And I can, I know these farmers that are doing fine, but you don't really hear, hear about mm-hmm. them at all. But it's true. They're, farming is a great way to make a living. And if you pay attention to your business side, you can do very well. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking Bill Gates well, but still yeah. pretty well. Yeah, I was just in one of our private groups. We had one of our, we had some of our members sharing their numbers, and one of them is doing seventeen thousand dollars a week at farmers markets, and you know another one is easily going to do uh, did did ten k in just profit in one month. So you know, just seeing these farmers that are really crushing it, um, and I know farmers in Vermont that are driving um, new Lexuses because they have dialed their their market in and and they've made it work. But you're right, they're not out there sharing that. Why do you think that is? Do you think they're feel guilty that they're making money growing vegetables? Do you think they're just everyone else is perpetuating the poor farmer thing and so they don't want people to look at them differently? I think that it's human nature not to brag that mm-hmm. a and especially amongst a group of farmers that are in the paradigm where they're never going to make any money. I mean, if you if you if you keep saying to yourself, you know, there's no money in farming, there's no money in farming, wow, your dream comes true because yeah. you won't make any money. And then if you're to have someone making money, go into a room full of these folks, it's like it's falling on deaf ears. I do fine. I, I'm not going to hide the fact that I'm making a good living. I'm paying my people well and saving for retirement. Again, I'm not Bill Gates rich, but I am. I do it because I love farming, but I also do it because I need to support myself. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about that. So you had that, that conversation. So that was around 2000 and no, sorry, 1993. 1993 was when I took that closing manager and I also bought the farm later that year as well. Yeah. And so then did that have a huge mindset shift for you? And then that did things really start to change after that? That was a time when I really started doing some serious number crunching and Mm -hmm. it was because of this workshop because I kind of took time out. I mean, I took time to work on my business instead of just in my business. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a great advice for anybody is just to make sure you do some of that. And when I did that, I kind of analyzed the 42 different crops that I was growing in terms of profitability, regardless of what acreage I was growing. And then I could rate them in terms of profitability and said, well, why am I growing these ones that are not mm-hmm. that profitable or even losing money. I'm just going to stop growing them. So I did. And all of a sudden, my profitability, overall profitability rose. It makes total sense. And, you know, by looking at those numbers and look, kind of shining a light on the inner workings of my business, I could then make very um, cogent decisions about how to best make my business more profitable because I could focus on crops that were doing well or look for markets or even make even more money from the crops that were doing pretty well to begin with. And from the outside, I think if you were to come look at my farm, you'd say, well, Richard's running around like crazy with his crew and looks like nothing different, nothing has changed. But just through crop selection alone, I could end, you know, in that first year, just my net profit increased $10,000 just from crop yeah. selection alone. No changes, you know, and that's like, that that was huge. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that was a massive morale boost. It's a total morale boost. And also just looking towards the future saying, huh. There's a lot more out there that I can realize here that I didn't think was possible. And and again, I think it's more of just getting in the headset of saying, yes, this is possible. And once you have that headset, it's like, wow, it's, yeah. you know, I'm not the poor farmer anymore. I'm, I'm the entrepreneur. Yeah, it's going from not just a farmer, but a business owner slash entrepreneur and right. a huge difference there. And a lot of this you talk about in your book because you just mentioned like enterprise budgets or um, you know running the numbers and all that's in your book as resources, right? That's correct. Yeah. In fact, you know, the reason I wrote that book was to, you know, I had been doing some conferences in the 90s, you know, at the uh, organic farming conferences and talking about different things, but started to focus more on business after I went through this kind of revel- revelation in 1993. And I noticed a lot of same questions coming up. And then in 2004, I started working for the Vermont Farm Viability mm-hmm. Network, which is a group that helps farmers with business plans to help do better you know, in the business world. When I was working with farmers, the same questions would keep popping up. And so I said, well, hey, heck, I'll just write these ideas down on paper instead of keep talking about it and eventually turned into a book that, you know, was meant pretty much just to help farmers with the business end of their farm, as well as any small business. But, you know, it was very farm centric view trying to make Uh it farmer friendly. 
Yeah, I remember that was, I think, the first, around that, I think 2005, 2006 was our first introduction to you because you were working with Eric Pillimer um, that was farming okay. in Paulette, Vermont at that point. Yep. So we interned for, right. for that for a year. And I remember him talking to us about you working with him through the numbers and actually helping him in, implement cultivation on his farm and going to a standardized you know, row spacing and all that kind of stuff and how freeing that was and how that actually made his business really explode. The work is really rewarding for me when I see people kind of like all of a sudden the light goes off and mm-hmm. boom, they take the ball and run with it. And I see some farms here that are just like you said, they're crushing it. They're, you know, look at a market opportunity and seized it and capitalized on their business so they can continue to do that. It's a very rewarding thing to see. Mm-hmm. If there was a magic reset button as it relates to starting your farm, what systems would you go back and put into place sooner rather than later? Probably two things. One thing I did in maybe the mid-90s was kind of do a total re- redesign of the farm in terms of having designated areas for, you know, wood shop, metal shop, a pack house, pack and wash center, storage for lumbers, tools, fertilizer, seeds, all that kind of thing. With kind of a, before it became a concept to me, the lean farming mentality of everything, a place for everything and everything in its place. Mm -hmm. That was one of them. And the other thing I would probably do if I had a reset button, it's not that I was risk averse. In fact, I took a lot of risk, but I was probably loan averse, especially, you know, after borrowing so much money that I, I wanted to pay that off. So I didn't necessarily buy some tools or borrow money to buy some tools that would have had a quick payback from the get go. Instead, I would just slowly salt away money and then buy them when I had the money. And I think in hindsight, I should have been more open to borrowing money, other money, just to buy a root washer harvesters, things that have a quick payback from the moment you buy them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Some of those are such key pieces of infrastructure. And if you know you can do the ROI on them, it makes absolute sense to pick them up ASAP. Absolutely. And that knowing what you need is, you know, you make sure that, you know, you have a system that or a weak link in your production that you say this tool will really make a big difference. Yeah. Talk to us about that weak link. What are some common weak links you see farmers face? I think if I were to look at it from a crop production or a crop budget standpoint, most of the money in an expense side of a crop budget, it goes into cultivation or hand weeding really, and then harvest and pack. Mm -hmm. So those are the areas where you want to be as efficient as possible. The seeding doesn't take that long. The prepping of the soil doesn't even take that long. So those kind of tools don't tend to pay off as quickly as things that might be a a basket weeder on a cultivating tractor or a flame weeder or Mm -hmm. a root undercutter or a barrel washer. Those kind of things, because the numbers are so much bigger in the cost of production in any crop budget, most crop budgets, those that's where the big payback is. Mm. So that's great, and we'll be back right after this. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. In this resource bundle, you're going to find an ebook on winter growing. We have an ebook called the Profitable Farmers Toolkit, which has been downloaded by literally thousands of farmers from around the world. And you're going to find our ebook called Building Your Farm Six Key Characteristics of the Right Property. And so in that e-guide, you'll find what soil types to look for in your farm, how to figure out where to buy your farm based on local weather patterns, what types of road to try to locate your farm on so that it doesn't limit the growth of your farm, and why it's better to buy 10 acres closer to the city than 1,000 acres further away. So head on over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. So we're back with Richard for the second half of this interview. Richard, you're starting to farm with your son. That's working with a partner. How are you How are you setting that up? How are you dividing roles? How does that work for you? My son is 32 and, you know, uh, born and raised on the farm, has worked here since he was a kid, helping out at a farmer's market, on and off. And while well, he went to school and then ran his own carpentry business with some friends for about six years. And kind of said, well, he was questioning whether he wanted to keep doing that the rest of his life. And so that was when we started discussion of saying, hey, you want to come back on the farm and work something out? And 
that was last year. So last year was our kind of our first trial year of managing together. And then this year we're co-managing again. And at the end of this year, we'll kind of take a serious look down the road and say, okay, how, what we see is going on. It's hard to see, you know, going from A to C, it's, we don't really know where B is yet. And we might mm. not even get to B. But so, you know, we're trying to say, okay, let's just at the end of this year, let's talk and evaluate things. But my hope, or maybe it's a hope or goal, but is to have the farm continue. I've been doing it for 38 years, and it'd be nice. There's a, you know, it's a, a pretty well oiled machine that it would be easier to keep going. And if my son wanted to keep it going, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. And if he doesn't, that's fine too. But if you did want to do it, I think then I would step back more and more. I like my work. In fact, I can see working for another, you know, 10, 15 years. I'm 62 now. And, you know, I just don't want to work as much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Being able to take so, that step back. So take a step back. And so the way it works right now is my son and I, you know, Monday mornings, we spend an hour or two looking at what has to happen and delegating responsibilities, putting it on the calendar some of the times we work together, sometimes by necessity, if it's a building project, we need both of us there. Sometimes we just go off and do our own uh, task list. But it works out great. And part of it is because we get along really well. I think I've yeah. heard some families have, you know, interpersonal relationship problems, not problems, but just road bump, uh, yes. potholes, whatever you want to call them. Flint and I, we think alike. We have fun together. And so far, so good. I'm really excited about what's happening. Mm. So when you brought him on, were there any, you know, bumps that you guys had to figure out as he started to step into that management or did things just from the start work out real seamlessly? So far from the start, it's worked out pretty well. Technically, he's still an employee and right ah. now, he, you know, he gets paid, you know, I, I write checks and he, but the responsibility, we both do everything together and troubleshoot. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, in any transition of the farm, and if you have other podcasts with people that are transitioning, they're going to bring this up, that, you know, you have the assets of a farm, whether they're the greenhouse and tractors and equipment, mm-hmm. and then also the real estate of the farm, those need to get some out of transfer. But there's also the power and management that gets transferred over. So at some point, if he becomes the, the owner operator and I become a helper, then I just, you know, bite my tongue when I think something mm-hmm. should be done differently or I suggest it, but it's not my, it's not my authority anymore. So who knows what will happen, but that's, you know, the way I see it kind of evolving. Mm-hmm. Well, that's super cool. And I look forward to checking in with you in a couple of years as that keeps going on, if that works out for you guys, see how that's all played out. So is, does he have like ideas that he wants to, to change with the farm or add to the farm at all? Has he expressed that with maybe some marketing or is he just really content to keep going exactly how you guys have been going forward? He's content to continue the way we've been doing it because we have established markets and established ways of producing things. And so why fix it if it's not broke? But he is a, he does think of other things to do. And just like the CBD hemp that we did last year, Mm -hmm. you know, his kind of his prerogative, I guess, and interest, you know, those are the things that, you know, he'll look at those or do other things, maybe grow hops, who knows. But I figured right now we'll just keep the, the train riding on the tracks. And then once we switch management, then he can take it wherever he wants to go. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So what is the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers making? I know there's a lot of, you know, Vermont has been always a hotbed of farming, especially recently, a lot of new farmers have started. The biggest mistakes, there's a few, I guess. And it's kind of a shame to see someone starting out full of enthusiasm and some savings and working really diligently and doing their best, but then kind of exhausting their financial resources and also feeling overworked and then they stop farming. And that's kind Mm -hmm. of too bad. So I guess some of the biggest mistakes are, you know, just leaving it to hope and hard work to have your farm succeed and Mm -hmm. not looking at the business end again, looking, you know, working on your business, not just in it. And maybe a mistake would be acting first and thinking second. It seems kind of Mm -hmm. obvious when I say it that way, but, you know, think first, act second. And again, this might be another genetic fault of farmers, but tend to bite off too much. And I Mm -hmm. put myself in that same category. You know, I want to do everything all the time and there's only seven, there's only so many hours in a day. You know, make a plan of what you think you can do and how much money you're going to bring into the checkbook and how much money you're going to keep out of that money you bring in. You know, be realistic about what you can do. So Mm -hmm. those are, you know, that's my advice, I would guess, to any beginning farmer. Make a little plan. It doesn't have to be a big, huge business plan. Just say, okay, let's just 
pencil it out a little bit and write it down and see if this is going to work. Mm-hmm. I would also say they should just read your book. <laughs> there's so much well, value you know, there. My book, my book will help, but there's a lot of things that happen, you know, on the ground that, you know, it's good to do yourself. I think it's great. There's so many resources now to help small farmers, beginning farmers to run their business. And mm-hmm. whether it's TA in the field, whether it's looking at their financial end of things, make use of those because a lot of the times they're free or at a very discounted price. Yeah. And Vermont has done an especially good job of making resources available with, you know, the work Vern has done. And then now the whole Vermont team, you know, you got Chris Callahan up there too and his team. So it, there's a lot of resources available. Those are two. The UVM extension team is great. There's the Intervale Foundation, the Intervale Center, rather, hmm. which in Burlington does great work with, you know, getting farmers, you get their feet on the ground and running. And then Vermont Farm Viability Program, which is a huge resource to get people to really do an in-depth look at their business, a year-long process with, you know, multiple meetings to really kind of fine-tune what you want to do. Absolutely. So let's talk about your book. Um, you talked a little bit about the journey writing it. You know, what has the feedback been from farmers that have that have gone through it? I get a lot of positive feedback because, see, I write about things that nobody else writes about, and that's for a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, welcome to the most unfun, unglamorous topic in farming, and that's looking at your business end of your farm. And people put it off and they kind of, you know, put their head in their sand around finances, but eventually they realize that, you know, push comes to shove, they got to look at it. A lot of people read the book and find it helpful because it does address things farm-friendly way about just practicalities of how to run a business. And, you know, that was my goal. My goal was to help farmers and see more farmers succeed or not fail because they didn't look at their business. Mm-hmm. And what year was that written? That was in 2009. And that's 10 years ago, actually. I mean, 10 years ago this fall. The book, you know, I think about it now, some of the, I do a lot of spreadsheets, which unfortunately are kind of mind-numbingly complicated because I had to be transparent to the reader. But there's a lot of information in that fine print if you take time to look at it. But for me, on our own farm, my son and I use more simplified budgets because we don't need to be transparent except for each to each other. Mm-hmm. But that said, people can use those templates and do their own budgets and also make them simpler if they want. But the idea behind it all was actually just give people the tools so they can carry it out themselves, even if they do just one or two budgets so they can mm-hmm. say, oh, am I making money growing 10 acres of winter squash or am I making money growing greenhouse tomatoes? You want to know, especially with your biggest sellers, the biggest sellers are bringing the most money into your checking account, which you then try to squeeze your net profit from. You want to make sure those bigger sellers are paying for themselves. If you're only growing 40 feet of radishes, I wouldn't bother even analyzing it. But if you're growing five acres of winter squash, I'd make sure that you're Mm -hmm. pricing it accordingly or making money at the price that you already have. Exactly. Yeah. One of the simple, quick things we started doing was breaking down crops into dollars per square foot per week. And so what that allowed us to show is, you know, greenhouse tomatoes, yes, it has a massive per square foot. And actually, they're still one of the most unprofitable crops out there in our research. But you compare that to something like salad mix or, you know, something that that one of these other crops and it really kind of shows you if you're land limited, what your, your profit potential is. And I think most people are land limited, and that's why a profit or gross sales or net profit per acre is so important. Mm -hmm. And when you mention greenhouses, you know, that is expensive real estate. And so to compare crops, you know, in the greenhouse is always good because you're paying for this this structure Mm -hmm. and the heat and electricity and anything else. I wouldn't compare the... I mean, you could compare the inside solid mix to field-grown solid mix because it'll be a little different, especially with tomatoes, because, you know, again, that high-value real estate inside the greenhouse is going to provide a lot more sales dollars per square foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you also have to account for the costs. So, because we did some enterprise budgets, you know, including all the costs of the greenhouse. And I think we tried to depreciate five cents, I think it was five cents per square foot per week back to paying for the greenhouse cost. Yeah, that may, that's a great way of doing it. Some way yeah. of saying that you have to pay for the greenhouse somehow, and the best way of doing it is through the crops that are grown in it, as opposed to walking off, working off the farm to pay for it. Yeah. There's a, actually, you know, just for your listeners, there's a great study done by NOFA Vermont, N-O-F-V-T dot org, on cost reductions of five different field crops as well as greenhouse tomatoes. And hmm. the first one took 30 farms in Vermont, 
New Hampshire and Massachusetts, 10 different crops across 30 farms, so kind of, you know, some in each state, and looking at, you know, how much it costs to produce it in different categories and what their sales price was and what their net profit, and also overall farm categories, like how much what percentage they spent on overhead or what percentage mm-hmm. of gross they spent on marketing or what percentage of gross they spent on labor. So it's interesting and to see really how there are kind of benchmarks evolving out of all mm-hmm. this that, you know, people spend 15 to 20% on marketing, whether they do it through a CSA farmer's mm-hmm. market or deep root get you know, and so it's interesting. But anyway, so your readers can go to nofavt.org and just Google or cert in the search bar costs of production and you'll find a bunch of, it's all open source. Um, awesome. Workbooks and also a workbook they can use yourself. Awesome. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes. Um, so that's awesome resource for them. So let's talk about employees um, because that's obviously one of the biggest challenges we see farmers face. What strategies have you implemented to make sure you bring the right kind of team members on? Before I started making money, I was paying people kind of a going wage, but, you know, on the low end of things. When I started making money and I could pay myself much better, then I would feel bad if I paid people low wages while I made made high mm-hmm. wages. So we started paying people well, and we pay people much better than our neighbors. I mean, nothing against our neighbors, but, you know, in terms of the going rate, we pay quite a bit more. And money talks, you know, people Mm -hmm. like that extra money in their paycheck. And there's kind of a more team effort because of it. There's less turnover. People like their jobs and they stick around. The other thing we did was we have a a SEP IRA, a simple employee pension IRA, Mm -hmm. which if they work here for three years, over $500 a year. So after their third year, Tate Farm, we will contribute 25% of their gross wages into a IRA that their owner of a custodial account of theirs, they get to choose it. They own the money. But so if I have an employee that makes $10,000 in a year, on December 31st, I write a check for $2,500 to mm-hmm. them in a custodial account of Vanguard or the local bank, CD, or whatever it is. I can't write it to them. I have to write it to yeah. a financial institution. But they own the money. And if the next day they want to cash out, they can do that at a 10% penalty. But I you know, say, hey, it's better save retirement because this is a great way of doing it. And that, you know, a lot of people love the fact because they wouldn't do it on their own. You know, the, mm-hmm. as the business, that's a perk that we give them is a chunk for their own IRA savings. We tend to be, we're not a co-op in legal structure, but we're very cooperative minded. You know, we want, you know, we believe that everybody should work together, whether it's, you know, here at Kate Farm, you know, employees and quote unquote management. But, you know, we try to make everything work together and, uh, you know, we get solicit feedback from our employees for things. And we're trying to be cooperative with our neighbors as well. I mean, our neighbor growers as well. Yeah. Now, how long do you have some of your employees stick around on your farm? Well, that's a good question. Like one of them has been working since she was in middle school, but that's on and off. She, uh, she started, she's a good friend of my daughter's and she worked here when she was in middle school and high school at the farmer's market. But then, you know, just started, she came back maybe four years ago. And she's kind of one of the regular greenhouse managers. We've had other people, when we were doing a lot more things and we had a bigger crew, we don't have as big a crew anymore, but when we had five full-time people, we'd have people stick around five, six, seven years. And that's Uh really nice. I mean, it makes my job so much easier, Uh you know, in terms of people love to do. I don't, you know, once they've done a year or two, they can make decisions on their own and I can get my work done that I need to get done. uh, Uh Exactly. Working on the business. Right. Working on the business or, you know, I have my own punch list to do. And when I'm managing employees, you know, I don't necessarily get that done. Employee management takes time and Uh it usually takes someone to, you know, make sure all the ducks are in a row and the supplies are in place. And if when something goes wrong that, you know, things get switched around. So there's, whether it's me or my son Flint or a middle manager, you know, there's someone there to, make sure everything is running smoothly. Yeah. Let's talk about your marketing. You know, what channels are you focusing on now? The marketing, we, you know, it's kind of changed, but we've always done a wholesale around central Vermont. That's been our kind of, our Mm -hmm. kind of our tried and true thing. We did a farmer's, I personally did farmer's market for 26 years, but no longer. And that's kind of 
more of a change of our product mix. So we haven't gone for about five years to the farmer's market. We had a CSA in the 1990s, very popular, but stopped for reasons not that we didn't like it, but we just changed our product mix. And we're longtime members of Deep Root Co-op since 1985. So those markets are, right now, we're pretty much all wholesale. So instead of doing any retail, we're all wholesale, except for we open four weekends in the spring to sell some plants from the farm. But that's the okay. only retail we do. Yeah. And so we don't, you know, in terms of marketing, because we have kind of have established markets, we're not really searching for new markets. So it's kind of using the same marketing channels we always have. Yeah. Gotcha. Just keeping those same relationships going. Correct. So with your, like your plant sale, do you have like an email list you email people about? Do you have a roadside sign that you put up or? We do roadside signs just during the weekends that we uh, have the sale. We have it you know, on our website. We have an email list. We put on Facebook, we Instagram, and try to you know give a presence. We take out paid ads in the local newspaper and in radio. We put flyers up. So we kind of, during the four week, really it's only a month of uh, weekends, that we just try to get the word out. And then after that, everything else is wholesale, so we're not really promoting ourselves. We do make contact with all our wholesale accounts in the wintertime to say, okay. you know, how things are going, how did it go, you know, any changes for next year, you know, what can we do better, you know, you know, basically have that feedback loop yeah. for the, for us as well as for our um, accounts. That's an important part. And we do, it's an official sit down sometime in January, but also during the course of the year, I, I try to do deliveries because that's another feedback loop. So I get to talk to the produce managers in person. Mm-hmm. Not all the time, but, you know, enough so they have a chance to say, hey, Richard, you know, the cukes are a little crooked or, you know, or whatever it might be. But the tomatoes are a little too ripe or underripe. Who knows? So do you, you say you do that maybe once a month or how often do you try to do those deliveries so you can check in with them? I do deliveries at least once a week probably. And I think that's an important space for them to see me as well as other members of our team do deliveries because you know, the buck stops here. <laughs> really, yeah. it does. And like, I want to know if something's wrong, I want to know. And I'm probably my best self-promotion in terms of promoting my business because it's my business. Uh-huh. So let's talk about future farmers. You know, there's a lot of people trying to get into it, thinking about getting into it. And there's a lot, I think we've talked about this earlier, the mental game, you know, the fears, the worries, the doubts, the struggles. What would you say to them? Kind of what I said before was think first, act second, you know, uh-huh. make a plan. Don't bite off too much and enjoy the ride. You know, it's a process. Again, look at your business. Don't go in there idealistically and think that it'll all work. And it might just from, you know, sheer luck, but things happen. I think the biggest fallacy in farming is there's no money in it. But that said, it's not the easiest way to make a living if you don't think about it. And I don't want to sugarcoat it, but, you know, starting a farm is like, you know, serious liftoff, you know, fasten uh-huh. your seatbelt and prepare for takeoff because you learn a lot on the way up, but um, you got to hang on. Uh-huh. How long do you think an average farm takes before it hits profitability? I would think probably six, seven years. At that point, they've kind of figured out how to grow things, uh-huh. how to juggle all the things you need to do running a farm and also realize that they want to work less and make more money. Mm. And so at that point, they're going to probably start questioning and saying, hmm, how do we make this work better? Some people, you know, in my workshops, I give, you know, there's some people that have been doing five or six years, seven years. Some people have been doing it 25 years and, they, mm-hmm. you know, they want to come in and say, okay, uh, you know, I've been doing this. I've been working way too hard for too long. I'm ready to change. Mm-hmm. What do you think of either interning or apprenticing? Is that a good way for them to start getting some some education? That is a very big and debated topic. Um, I know. <laughs> so anyway, well, I can, I'll try to give the, the points of the discussion. Labor expense is usually the single biggest item on any profit and loss of a farm. It's usually mm-hmm. a third or more of their expenses. You yep. know, and that's big. And so that said, that's not good or bad. It's just a farming is a labor, labor intensive business. It doesn't mean we should pay people less and it doesn't mean we should treat people any differently. It's just that you just have to realize that you're going to spend that kind of money on, on labor. The obvious thing when you're starting out and you don't have a lot of money or profitability is to reduce that so you can survive. 
So maybe apprentices and interns are, you know, appropriate for somebody beginning, but also it's kind of odd that, you know, if you're an apprentice, you want to study with somebody who's got a lot of experience, right? If you want to learn. Mm-hmm. So it's a little oxymoron there. The, the thing is, you know, I advocate if you're making money, you should be paying people a living wage. I mean, that's, that's what mm-hmm. I believe. And you can, since there are a lot of young or not even young, but just people that want to learn about farming are willing to work for little or less than minimum wage, you know, farms can take advantage of that. But should they? I don't think so. If they can make it work, I think it's a, a farm's responsibility to, you know, make money so they can pay employees well. You know, mm-hmm. uh, ultimately, why would you expect that with a shoe store? Think, well, I need apprentices to run my shoe store, or a you know, insurance company say, well, we have to run with apprentices. I don't think so. So apprentices, I think, are good because apprentices have a place where you know they can you know, a small farm or a farm can start out and you know mutually benefit with people working. Learn, they're actually learning something and gaining something, and have less than a living wage employee. But at some point, I think farms should, you know, stand up and say, okay, we're going to start paying people and making it work so we can pay people. I mean, do you envision a world where our farms are dependent on underpaid labor? I don't think that would work, you know. And no, it I don't doesn't. think we, we want to believe in that. So why, if we don't believe in it, why are we doing it? The other element is this, the legality of it. Here in Vermont, you probably heard this, but there was uh, the Department of Labor cracked down on some farms that also had a not, I wouldn't say a non-farm enterprise, but a cidery or a mm-hmm. yogurt facility or packing shed that, you know, had to meet Department of Labor standards like paying overtime. And so when these apprentices walked into this kind of on the radar facility, then the farmers got fined because all of a sudden they weren't paying overtime when they should have. Mm. And so they got into trouble and they got some fines. And so now there's, there's a watchful eye from the Department of Labor on farms. And so having apprentices, it's you know more scrutinized than it used to be. Yeah. And, and so my whole thing on the apprentice side is, yeah, you should only be having them if you have education to offer them and you should be paying them. And my thing is, if they are going to be learning from you, you need to be able to have time in your schedule to be able to teach them. You That's better, correct. And, and, yeah. and not just weed carrots for a month and pick beans for a month and say, thank you very much. Exactly. You should be able to be walking them through the entire inside and outside the business and what it takes to run a farm because that's what they're there to learn. Right. And that would be nice. And I think that takes time. And sometimes those hours are the hardest things to find in a farmer's day. Yeah. And I think it all comes back to one of the interviews we did was with um, Jordan Green, who actually runs a animal farm down in Virginia. Um, But his whole thing is he said, you know, I could be hiring those people, but I would rather hire pro employees. Like, as you said earlier, you said, you know, if I have employees that know what they're doing, I don't have to manage them. They pretty much run themselves. And so he says, I want those kind of people that free up my day so I can work on my business or punch out my own punch list. That's a very good point. And, and those people, especially if they come back year after year, make the managers of farmer's job so much easier. Yes, they limit the gray hairs. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we did intern slash apprentices for two years, the last couple of years, and I swore it off. Um, we had a guy who put a tractor up to its axles in a field as oh, really? after, after he put the pickup truck up to its axles in the same field. <laughs> yeah, it was just, we had one guy who he just would forget the market bag every single week when he leave a farmer's market, even though he was, he had a checklist to follow. You know, he had the checklist in front of him that said, make sure you grab the certain things. And yeah, it was one of those that things. Could, that could happen with a paid employee too, but <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate. It's harder when you have an apprentice do it because it's like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot harder to just get rid of them because if it's an employee, you're like, you know what, this is the standard. You're not reaching the standard. We need to part ways. The apprentice, yeah, it's just a little bit different situation. And yeah. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Uh, that's an impossible question, Michael. <laughs> 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 I read that. It's like, it's like my favorite tool. It's like, can I do, can I do three different types of tools? Like, I sure. would say yeah. in the pack house, my favorite tool because it's so it's only three dollars is one of those wire tying tools where you know you yep. can take a, a steel band and with loops on it and put it around a bag. Three dollars, it's cool and it works so well. Uh-huh. Probably in the greenhouse, 
it hands down goes to the trolley for moving things around. Trolley is oh. like we have it going from one greenhouse to the other, in and out side on both ends. We can dump compost. We can bring it to the mm-hmm. outside of hard and offer to for deliveries. Trolleys are just I just love it. And then in the field, that's another really tough one. But I would probably say the mini chisel, which is kind of a mm-hmm. spring loaded shank that it goes down 14 inches right underneath the row you're going to plant. And so instead of using a rotor tool, you can kind of rip the soil without inverting it. And then uh-huh. we use a bed former on top, or you could use a rotor tool on top. But it's such a nice way of preparing soil for planting. Uh-huh. Especially because so you, know, I mean, you could talk about baskets, you could talk about flamers. I mean, there's, there's so many great tools out there, and I wouldn't want to limit myself. Maybe you could say, what are your top 20 tools? And that might make more sense. <laughs> well, you know, I should have you back on an episode just to talk your top 20 tools. <laughs> but, well, that might be a good topic. You know, you get a bunch of people to say, okay, what are your top 20 tools? And, you know, depending on, you'll get probably some overlap, but I bet you'll get a lot of uh, yeah. new things. So you talk, call that a mini chisel, but you're still going down like 14 inches, and you run that right underneath the row. Correct. So we do our rows on 13-inch centers, so okay. 26 on the two outside one, one down the middle. Yep. And so we have the chisels ripping right down those rows, and then with our bed former, we have row markers on that little spring yep. on the back of the bed former that mark where those rows were, so we can then plant right on top of that. Mm-hmm. And then do you have those staggered? So like, you know, one's further back than the other two on the chisel? They're on the chisels, that's the way they do work. You know, you yeah. can do it any different ways, but there's two in the front and one in the back. And that way, if there's a clump of sod, it doesn't get clogged up. It'll yeah. kind of go through it. Yeah, better. flow. Yeah. yeah, that was something we were we were working on because we had that big challenge where we had them too close and stuff would get caught. And then you're causing disaster. It, Chisels don't work well in fresh sod, or they tend to have they bunch up a little bit more. Yeah. But they're great, you know, primary tillage tools if it's got, you know, not a lot of trash on the top. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, after you've got the ground prep. So real quick, if you're prepping new ground, do you like to moldboard plow it first, or do you just disc it, or what's your usual if you're coming into fresh sod? So fresh sod, we will probably moldboard plow. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, the alternative would be to disc it multiple times or, it, I mean, you, you could tarp it if it's a small area, but if you're talking acres, then yeah. it would be moldboard and then disking probably once, resting a week again, and then uh-huh. again to knock back the perennial weeds. Maybe taking an s tine harrow through it to pull up any remainder uh, rhizomes, and then uh-huh. from there using the mini chisel, making beds, and then a bed former. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's nothing. I know it's 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 a frowned upon piece of equipment. There's nothing quite like plowing with a moldboard plow. They are very effective. They do tend to have so much pressure that they make that plow pan, and that's why the chisel is so great because it yeah. breaks up that plow pan. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right, final question here. Do you believe that now is the best time to start a farm? And if so, why? I think any time is the best time to start a small uh, farm. And, you know, maybe the markets will change, but small farms are kind of the backbone of our economy. Kind of sad, like when IBM announces that, oh, they're going to have 20 new job openings, you know, makes this huge news. It's a big splash. But when 15 farm couples start a farm and carve out a place in the marketplace and support themselves with it, it's totally invisible and off the radar. Mm -hmm. But that is what is really helping the economy because, you know, here they are growing healthy food for their community. They're bringing dollars in. They're recycling them around their neighborhood because they're paying them local people to work there. They're buying at the local stores. And then those folks spread it around even more by buying pizza or going to the co-op. And it has this huge multiplier effect. So I am such a believer in small farms being a great economic engine for the greater world, but also just to support a family or a group of families by you know using natural cycles and ecological principles to produce a healthy product. I mean, really, what could be better? Absolutely. Well, Richard, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And I know our listeners do as well. My pleasure, Michael. Good talking with you. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please.